Hello, I'm Catherine Burns. I'm a historian by profession and I work at WISER, a research institute based at WITS. This year is the 100th anniversary of the African National Congress, the ANC, the current ruling party of South Africa, in power since the 1994 Democratic Revolution and its elections. It is extraordinary in this year of transition that the ANC holds its 52nd policy conference at Gallagher Estate in June. To mark this key event and to offer detailed analysis, WISER, a research unit at Wits University, in conjunction with the Mail and Guardian, has gathered on May the 30th to dig down into the ANC policy documents. <laughs> Here are the highlights of the day that we held at WISER from 9 in the morning until 7 in the evening where we really deeply dug into the ANC policy documents covering more than six key areas. Good morning colleagues and ladies and gentlemen and friends. Uh, my name is Belinda Bazzoli and I'm the acting director of WISER, this wonderful institute and it's a great privilege to welcome all of you here this morning. The event was opened by Dean Tawane Kupe, the Dean of Humanities at Wits University. Good morning ladies and gentlemen and thanks Professor Bozoli for, for this opportunity to open this conference. Tawane Kupe is a specialist in the area of media, journalism and communication. He placed the policy documents in the wider context of communication and debate across the airways and in different media in Africa and in the region. I'm pretty proud that we're doing this today, discussing the ANC policy papers. The ANC releases these papers and, says, and invites people to discuss these papers, to critique them and to comment. I don't know how many people actually take up the invitation. What I would like to see in our papers, unless of course it's not happening on the ground, is a reflection of what kind of debates are happening around the ANC policy papers. Because I think the ANC is unique in our country, in our continent, as a party that releases these documents for public com comment and there's an elaborate and extensive process for apparently discussing these policies and finally adopting them at a Congress at the end of the year. Whether one likes it or not, policy matters, whatever you consider policy to be, and also you ignore an, 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 an organization like the ANC at your own peril. Here are opening comments by Professor Belinda Bazzoli. She is the acting director of WISER, a leading sociologist in South Africa and advisor to the Vice-Chancellor of Wits University. Now I just want to um, mention for those of you who weren't here last week that we did have a curtain raiser occasion where uh, Mr. Mwaletsi Mbeki spoke on what has the ANC achieved in the last 18 years. The government has taken thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres from the Africana farmer. They're lying fallow. Now, as you can imagine, it was a pretty so, raucous occasion um, at which he made some extremely telling points. And I just wanted to put those onto the agenda so that we don't, so that in a way the effort that he made in thinking about this matter doesn't go to waste and that our considerations today about what the ANC's idea of its second transition is uh, are, are set in that context. I think the essential point that he was getting at was that a major shift has occurred in the economic system being overseen by the ANC during the 18 years of its rule um, and that this shift consists of the following that we, we are seeing a decline of the productive base of the economy or at least a static, uh, a static situation in the productive base of the economy and a rise in the economy consumptionist um, features. So the ANC has overseen the economy 
moving from an economy that had a very robust and um, slowly emerging um, industrializing base to an economy where the industrial base is declining, dependence on raw materials is increasing, that dependence depends on China's economy, while at the same time the levels of consumption have grown exponentially. Here is a presentation by Nick Dawes. I spent yesterday afternoon uh, rereading the main strategy and tactics document on the. He is process. the editor in chief of the Mail and Guardian newspaper and a key political commentator in his own right in South Africa. The document itself, I think, despite being encrusted with quite a lot of Moscow party school uh, language is in many ways a pretty sensible sketch of the failures and successes of the last 18 years. Um, you know, it sets the economic policies of the ANC, uh, the plans around uh, social transformation and demographic transformation in a pretty reasonable framework of globalization, um, of changes in the labor force here, um, and so on. And it's probably pretty sensible because it's mainly a product of the National Planning Commission, which is a sort of semi-detached wing of the presidency where the smartest policy people who are aligned to the ANC uh, sit and, and fabulate about what a rational course to 2030 would look like. There are at least um, two second transitions under discussion, discussion an Nzumandi Ramaklodi second transition and a National Planning Commission transition. There may even be a third and a fourth variant, although I think these are really supplements to the Nzumandi Ramaklodi strain, and those are the building of a national security state um, and the rise of authoritarian traditionalism as an important strain within uh, the ANC's discussion documents and indeed with legislative developments that are happening uh, right now. But the big strategy and tactics document starts out by saying something interesting and a little bit strange. We want to make the 53rd conference at Mangaung a watershed conference. Why do we want to make it a watershed conference? It's what it says is, it will be required like all national conferences to review progress with regards to our strategic objectives, to review our policies, assess the state of our organization and elect the national leadership. During its 100-year existence, the ANC has held 52 such national conferences. Each addressed those issues, but a few among them stand out as watershed conferences because of the nature of the decisions taken, their signaling of major strategic and organizational shifts, and the process taking the struggle to the higher levels. The founding conference of 1912, the 1949 conference that adopted the program of action, and the 1969 Morohoro Consultative Conference come to mind. And then the ANC encounters a strange sort of temporal problem that's probably worthy of analysis in its own right and perhaps more in a wiser setting than a journalistic setting, which is that it says, of course, uh, what makes for a watershed conference is usually determined in hindsight by future generations looking back at particular events and how they impacted on subsequent developments in the country. Um, this discussion document will argue that we must aspire to make the 53rd conference a watershed conference for three reasons. Firstly, it's the centenary of the ANC. So we need to mark that centenary by doing something important. Uh, secondly, obviously more importantly, we're at risk of failing in our objectives. The whole project is under threat. So, you know, the party recognizes those concerns that um, Moletsi Mbeki indicated. And thirdly, the party itself is in a mess. It's torn apart by factionalism and um, battles over resources and struggling uh, to articulate a clear path and a clear purpose. So I think, I think people with your sorts of skills could spend quite a bit of time thinking about the strange temporal logic of, of planning for something that will only be recognized um, as historic in the future and about a kind of political thinking that works in epochal terms. Um, it's probably something that partly arises out of the kind of historiography that the ANC is comfortable with and, um, and a particular kind of approach to um, the way history works, but I'll, I'll stick with the more banal journalistic questions about these two substantive reasons announced by the party for needing to pull off such an important event. That is the mess in the party and the risk of failure for the project. Here we have a presentation by Ashil Mbembe, Professor of History and a senior researcher at WISER, 
one of the best known figures in debating the status and the future as well as the past of the post-colony in Africa today. I was struck uh, while reading these documents by something uh, that haunts, haunts them, so to say. Uh, it looks like the, ten, the tension of, of the, the end result. There, there are a lot of tensions in, in, in the documents. There are a lot of uh, issues that are unresolved in the documents. I would like to touch on some of them uh, very broadly. First of all, it seems to me that after uh, more than a decade of uh, uh, relative com complacency and uh, a number of self-congratulatory gestures, this country is, is gradually coming to um, a quadruple realization that is exacting a, a heavy toll on, on its psyche and that is displacing in a fundamental way what we now take to be the uh, uh, uncertain future both of politics and, and of culture. It seems to me that uh, what was labeled as the miracle 15, 18 years later has to indeed be uh, properly characterized as a stalemate. Because for each of the historical protagonists in the South African drama, this settlement resulted in no final victory and no crippling defeat. Rather, the country was ushered in a historical interval and 17 or 18 years later, it, it is still caught between an intractable present and an irrecoverable past between things that are no longer and things that are not yet. And this is the stalemate many would now like to puncture. And uh, all the debates on uh, uh, the constitution, the reform of the judiciary, nationalization, traditional court, are, it seems to me, evidence of the attempt to puncture uh, this stalemate and therefore usher what is characterized as the second transition. Third, it seems to me that the moral capital amassed during the, the struggle, the years of the struggle, has been dilapidated. The moral and symbolic capital that uh, somewhat helped to characterize South Africa as uh, a hope for not only the continent, but as uh, an experiment people all over the world looked for. That capital has been dilapidated. It has been dilapidated on the one hand by uh, the fact that proper critical thought has not been applied to, uh, to, to, to it in order to tease out uh, it, its, its universal meanings, uh, not it, so only its national meanings, but its universal meanings, but it al has also been dilapidated by uh, the failures of the ANC during these years. The uh, 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 corruption, uh, which is a fact, uh, we read about it almost on a daily basis. The uh, uh, incompetence, uh, the failure of, of, of del delivery, bad policy choices, and dubious international uh, uh, alignments, all of that has uh, uh, helped to dilapid dil dilapidate this uh, these cultural and symbolic capital. One of the results of which is that uh, we see now uh, a vocal refusal by, uh, in certain sectors of the white population, refusal to carry alone the, uh, the burden of a horrific past or the uh, uh, uncertainties of, of the present. Uh, the clerk's the, uh, statements on what apartheid was 
it seems to me can be read within that uh, or Zile's, uh, Helen Zile's comments on educational refugees uh, in, in, in the Western Cape, there is a, a reassertion, uh, it seems to me, of uh, a, a kind of uh, a speech that uh, builds on indeed the, uh, the fact that the ANC is no longer capable of, of speaking, uh, making a moral argument to, to, to anyone. Here is Lumkile Mandi, Chief Economist of the Industrial Development Corporation and a leading commentator on South Africa's economic policies and future growth potential. What I want to highlight uh, around the paper on state-owned enterprise as well as development finance institution is really how South Africa um, has uh, industrialized at uh, true low input cost. Firstly, making sure that there's is cheap. Secondly, logistics costs are very, very cheap. And more importantly, labor is very, very cheap. How do they do labor? They made sure that the wage uh, that was paid to African workers was very, very low. And all of you have learned uh, read that, you know, because the mining sector struggled to attract South African workers, then they were encouraged to, to import workers. Mozambicans and others came coming in. This for me is very, very important. Because I want to take away the whole concept that is contained in the NC papers, uh, as well as the comment that Moritz Zimbabwe made last week that, that around the manufacturing, that South Africa has industrialized and it industrialized exactly the same way that other nations have done. That you start from a low cost curve, you produce, when you reach a level whereby you're not competitive, you decentralize your industry. So, in our case, uh, what will have happened is that we have located some of our industries around our neighbors. So we have put our, our industries in Mozambique, uh, in, um, in Zambia, etc., to supply the sectors which are, which are very important in the reef to get this economy going. But we didn't do that. All of us are very familiar. We were not able to do that. Uh, part of the reason is that we are isolated uh, before 1994. And more importantly, to address the problem, we then decentralized to the homeland. Uh, all of you know the story, what happened in, Itu, in, in Itua, what happened in Babeliachi, and many other decentralization zones that the government tried to, uh, to industrialize to make sure that we contain the deindustrialization of the economy. Here is Stephen Gelb, Professor of Economics at the University of Johannesburg, and a leading commentator on South African economic policy for the last 20 years, digging down into the ANC's economic policy documents. Let me say, first of all, that I have no idea who wrote these papers. I was a bit depressed, I have to say, by the low quality, what I would regard as the very low quality of these documents as policy papers. I don't expect in this kind of work um, academic rigor or academic analysis, but I think that policy documents need to meet uh, a certain standard of quality, and in particular, um, I, I would think that what they need to do is either to spell out positions, policy positions which are aimed at mobilizing different constituencies or different social groups, or on the other hand, spell out uh, alternative options with different implications for uh, social groups so that they can become the basis, the documents themselves can become the basis of uh, debate within the party about what its uh, approach should be and who it's trying to mobilize in order to, to win or in this case maintain uh, power, political power. And I don't think that these documents actually achieve that. And I want to sort of mention a number of problems with it. The first thing, and, I, and in some ways the most disappointing issue is that these, these documents, and I, I'm referring primarily here to the one on economic transformation and the one on uh, the state-owned enterprises and development finance institutions, they make no distinction between the party and the state. Uh, they talk about we referring to both the ANC 
and to the government. For example, they talk about we now have formulated the uh, new growth path. We have formulated the IPAP, the Industrial Policy Action Plan. We have the uh, uh, trade policy strategic framework. Well, the last time I looked, those were government, South African government documents, not ANC documents. This presentation is by Daryl Glazer, Professor of Politics at Wits University and a widely respected political theorist in the field of contemporary South African and world politics. In fact, much depends on uh, certain things, uh, on how and uh, on what in fact the ANC means and intends by certain moves that it uh, indicates in these uh, documents. For example, most obviously, uh, what does the ANC mean by the National Democratic Revolution itself? Does it mean, uh, as I would hope it means, the, the pursuit of um, uh, various kinds of developmental objectives, in, including uh, greater social equality, in the context of a, a pluralistic constitutional order? Or does the ANC move, uh, intend moving ultimately towards some kind of uh, one-party regime that supersedes the existing democratic order. Another important consideration uh, concerns how one decodes the relationship between the, uh, the technical and the political in this document. Thus, uh, the ANC presents its proposals as, in effect, technical adjustments to improve uh, governance. And this uh, uh, framing might plausibly work as a defense of a, of a number of proposals, uh, including proposals to uh, introduce a differentiated approach to municipal planning, finance and support, to boost skills, to devolve further functions to cities, uh, to modify uh, the two-tier uh, system of uh, local government. Uh, the general aim in these cases seems to be to direct uh, finance and support where it's most needed to weaker municipalities while allowing cities to get on with doing their own stuff. And these ideas sound quite sensible to me. But I suspect that, the, uh, as I've already hinted, that the, the motive, say, for provincial boundary restructuring is much more narrowly uh, partisan. Again, uh, how does one interpret proposals to strengthen municipal legislatures? Uh, it sounds promising vis-a-vis -vis municipal executives. ANC doesn't have form in this area. It's generally defanged uh, the parliamentary branch of the state at the national level. Uh, how seriously can uh, we take the insistence that all changes will be transparent and negotiated in an inclusive way? Uh, you know, my impression is that transparency and negotiation in South Africa is secured only by uh, civil society opposition to opaque and unilateral government moves. Here is a presentation by Susan Boyson. Professor in the Witt School of Public and Development Management, she has written extensively about the ANC in its current formation in South Africa. I'm really going to uh, do a dead practical analysis, politically very interpretive, of, huh, there's a small little bit of sugar coating, but as one knows when a sweet is very sugar coated and very nice and colorful, the dark bit of chocolate follows inside. So there are a few things that give me hope in here, in the sense that there is recognition of the weak and continuously weak structuring of local government. And so much in South African policy implementation, service delivery, conditions of life on the ground depends on solid local government. And they address the problem, but it's not to say it's the first time it's being addressed. And in second place, this document does address that need for serious look at municipal finances and resourcing of municipalities. And those are indeed very good signals. There is much in this document that makes me, however, very cynical. And that makes, uh, that's largely anchored in the fact that I have seen many of these kinds of proposals before and other ones just do not go far enough. I'm very cynical for three or four reasons here. We do not see enough in these documents. They do not go far enough. They do not explain well enough why, why similar measures that had been tried before have been discarded, are being partially reinvented, are just being reformulated. So we see a lot of reinvention of a very old wheel in here. And 
Daisy knows very well what is wrong. Just, just to illustrate that, here on page 15 to 16, poor governance and accountability are major areas of concern. These manifest themselves in high levels of distrust in local government and the escalation of community protests. Level of trust in local government has declined sharply since 2004. Participatory government has lost meaning and content and in its place has risen communities who feel alienated and disconnected from decision-making processes and disempowered in influencing the affairs of the municipality. I've got their job cut out for them, but this, this document that I go argue here then does not go far enough. The big issue of local political governance, very interestingly, and that's where they also look at Municipal Systems Amendment Act that, act for, that was passed last year, resistance from Kosatu, um, on Music or party political office bearers not being allowed to be in management positions in council. And this is what I would identify just now as what I see as a long-termism in this document. This act was passed last year. It was signed into legislation soon after the local government election. And this document now, hold your breath, is looking at developing guidelines for the implementation of that. So it's very safe. The local government people for quite a few years to come are going to be able to fulfill both party, be, wear the two hats, party political and in government. And very interestingly, nobody has ever dared address that overlap on provincial and national levels. So one can very well imagine local government people coming, being in rebellion against it, saying, why can't we do that at local level, but at provincial and national level, that is just cool. If you want references to corruption, it is not, the word doesn't include any in this document. Also not mismanagement. Poor governance, yes, that it occurs once or twice. Weak financial management, I think it occurs once. Accountability, quite a number of times. Here is Professor Jonathan Claren of the Witz Law School. Daryl's asking if I'm going to restore balance, the balance of forces. Jonathan Claren brings his particular legal expertise to the judicial and legal aspects of the ANC's policy documents. What that policy document is not about is it seems to me is it does not, certainly does not cover the field of our topic for this section of um, governance and law. And indeed in this entire discussion, in this particular document at least, there's actually no apparent place for the judiciary or the courts. It's interesting, it is I think. Um, the major focus on the development state and actually the one that shows up in the government document as in you know there's another process about the role of the judiciary in the developmental state but this ANC policy on the developmental state nothing so you know very possible I'm making a mistake is there another policy document <laughs> that does have such a discussion right so in balance of forces it does use the word ju uh, judiciary as part of the definition of the state that seems to me to be a start. Um, and does, for instance, ask um, how do we strengthen and continually transform the legislatures, chapter nine institutions, and the judiciary to ensure that they contribute? But it's, you know, fairly bland. Right, the ANC, when it's talking about governance at this policy discussion level, is not talking about the judiciary at all. It, it, right, it's talking about provinces, it's talking about other things, it's not engaging with the court or administration of just, uh, judicial system. I think that's wrong because I think such a juncture in the form of the political economy of regulatory capitalism that is globally apparent and also instantiated in, in South Africa is uh, there is such a juncture. Courts are part of um, the governance and need to actually be looked at and have policy positions taken on, analyzed, regulated, the whole bit. One recent example would be the e-tolling. You know, obviously the courts and that bit is not the only part of that, but I think equally you can't, um, you couldn't really understand those politics in that particular episode without understanding some of the controversy, and it's ongoing, right? The government has decided to appeal the decision, and the outer people have decided to, you know, oppose that. Of course, they would. The presentation you're about to hear is by Dr. Dwayne Blau 
a medical doctor and public health specialist with a background also in management and statistics and epidemiology. He is going to offer contrasting views on the ANC policy documents around health and social transformation. Policy is a very uh, broad, elusive idea and means all sorts of different things to different people. But I wanted to just juxtapose two sort of extreme versions of policy. The one is a sort of aspirational principle uh, and policy is sort of less setting the sort of broad terrain of what's important. Uh, the other type of policy is a very detailed, uh, articulate, well-argued, technical appraisal of different policy options with a very clear plan for implementation. So you have a very sort of broad aspiration like we want national health insurance and then there's a very detailed technical policy about what actually is required to make that happen um, and of course this in this document is much more like the former it's a sort of very broad aspirational document that has some broad nice principles that we could all probably agree with but it isn't actually a very detailed appraisal of, of different policy options and a clear recommendation uh, for some of the advantages and disadvantages and what they might mean if they were implemented. For me that reflects some of the tensions we have around the notions of policy making and policy implementation. Um, it's commonly stated that in South Africa we have lots of good policies but we fail to implement them. I think that's a very commonly cited idea. I think those of us who work in policy analysis argue that in fact um, policies require, good policies can be implemented and the weaknesses in implementation are much as part of the failures of policy development. So when, when you're failing to implement, that means that there are some weaknesses in policy develop, in, in, the, in the policy development phase. So it's very difficult to work out how you translate these very broad aspirational ideas into actual policy that affects people on the ground. And within this document, there's a sort of idea that the ANC develops the policy and then they hand it over to government government will translate that into a clear plan and implement that policy and people's lives will change. Um, but I, for me there's a, there's a tension between the sort of weakness of the initial policy ideas. Uh, if they're not very well developed, if they're not very well articulated, if they're not very well uh, analyzed, uh, then you don't really have very good policy. So I suppose I'm trying to make a case that I don't think we have very good policy. We've got quite good principles and aspirations Everybody agrees with social solidarity in health, that's a good principle, but how to actually make it happen in the South African health system requires a much more complicated technical notion of policy. The difficulty is where do we get that technocratic uh, version of the policy? Where does it happen? Clearly it's not happening within the ANC NEC. I mean this document is very broad, it's very aspirational. There's no capacity, there's no technical machinery, there's no technocratic machinery within the ANC to develop that sort of detailed analysis of the different options and what we should do. But the real problem is that that, that technocratic machinery doesn't exist within the National Department of Health either example of why I say the capacity doesn't exist. At the moment, the Department of Health is undergoing a whole range of policy initiatives. NHI is obviously a big one, but there's a whole range of other ones. Re-engineering primary health care, a new HR plan, establishment of an Office of Health Standards Compliance. There's a whole range of policy initiatives. And in almost all of those, they have been developed by outside consultants or uh, exterior people funded largely by bilateral aid agencies because the National Department isn't able to mobilize the resources quickly enough in order to follow these very uh, sharp deadlines that the Minister of Health is, is enforcing on these policy processes. So the National Department itself is not creating these policies. Um, they're, they're actually developed often in very short time frames by consultants hired to write a particular policy. The whole re-engineering primary health care, the whole policy on human resources, the whole policy on Office of Health Standards Compliance, all of those have been developed by outside expertise. So we don't have the expertise in the National Department to develop this really detailed policy that we need to actually implement and make things work. And the problem is that in 18 years we've done very little to develop that internal capacity either. If I take up Belinda's challenge of talking a bit about what uh, Maletzi and Becky were saying, and one of, his, one of his arguments was that the expansion of the sort of social security system was really there to allow the political elite to buy votes from the underclass uh, that, uh, in order to keep them in power. But also that that process really undermines the real socio-economic development by, by, by 
limiting the ability of the economic system to generate growth. So health is a key part of the social security system. Um, and of course, NHI is a very significant and very expensive expansion of that social security system. So the, the question is, is it there just you know, to buy votes or is it really a fundamental intervention uh, that is needed in South Africa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Professor Jerry Kovadia is an A-rated scientist in South Africa and an internationally regarded professor of pediatrics and HIV science. So I'm going to straight away answer some of the questions that Duane raised. His presentation opens up the ANC policy documents around health and the future of the National Health Insurance Scheme. I'm going to make the case that uh, health is special. And the reason it's special is many of us in the health sector globally we, uh, consider it as a public good. And there are many other public goods and education is also a public good. A public good means like, you know what polio immunization is? Uh, protect your child and your child protects 10,000 others. So it's something that's good for the community and for the population. So our argument, and we've got really good precedence, uh, is that it's a public good as education. That's a rational why it's special. The second thing was affordability, so I'll deal with that. I agree with you in many aspects, but I don't agree that the rationale is not known. That's the first thing. And I don't agree that uh, Aaron ever said that, you know, we don't actually know what it costs and whether it costs too much or too little. I'll tell you what Praveen said. He sent somebody to the Planning Commission. I'll show you that. And I'll show you some, some other reports. So where do I get my evidence? You know, because everyone says uh, these people don't understand what they're doing. And I read another report from Wirtz from another person who said it was quite contemptuous of the Department of Health. I'll tell you where I, where I get my evidence from. We wrote a series in The Lancet. The Lancet is a premier clinical journal in the entire world. There were about 25 South Africans. We wrote five or six chapters. And that's thoroughly reviewed, peer reviewed, published. And that to me is an absolutely irrefutable unless somebody finds a fault, but they haven't. That's the one. The second thing is that um, we've consulted very widely on the NHI and the other planning within the planning commission. Thirdly, there's a wonderful uh, paper which has just come out in uh, the Bulletin of the World Health Organization. It was, I don't know whether Di uh, McIntyre worked at WITS, but she's now in Cape Town. She and another woman called Lori Gilson. So they've got a terrific paper on the national health system and it's uh, comparing uh, um, Ghana, uh, Tanzania, and South Africa. And they've got very positive things to say about national health issue. And the third thing, I mean, China started exactly like this 20 years or 50 years ago. Brazil started like this. Brazil was as bad as us. And a number of other countries, uh, Scandinavian countries, have compared them. Certainly, developing, I won't even use Cuba because you think that it's unusual. But anyway, all these countries have achieved uh, some sort of national health insurance. So it is, it's practicable, it's achievable. This presentation is by Shireen Hassim, Professor of Politics at Wits University and a widely regarded expert on gender and power in Southern Africa. Um, I wanted to begin by saying that I think we do, we really have to appreciate that there is in fact a gender discussion document that we can get our teeth into. Um, uh, in a context in which um, there is a widespread perception uh, in uh, among many uh, women's organizations that the vision of equality is no longer central to the ANC, um, that the, uh, that the uh, there appears to be a much less principled approach to dealing with uh, pressures from traditional leaders, uh, that there is a part of the leadership in the ANC that has actively promoted a discourse of social conservatism, homophobia and patriarchy, um, and, and, and in the context uh, of the rising levels of violence against women and particularly against lesbians. Um, the, there has been a, a huge uncertainty about the possibility of, of uh, translating um, rights into reality. 
So in the context of that backlash, not unrelated, by the way, to leadership struggles within the ANC, um, uh, which, for example, uh, saw Mbeki being identified as a kind of promoter of women's rights and feminism, um, and uh, Zuma as a kind of uh, man of the people understanding uh, the kind the uh, disregard or understanding the, the reasons why gender equality uh, doesn't uh, carry much support among certain sectors of the population. Um, so so the, the, the issue of gender equality, I think, is at the heart of all of those uh, issues. And I want to appreciate the fact that there is uh, this discussion document because I think it uh, uh, it signals that there is still a live debate in the ANC and I think that is important because the ANC has historically been the party uh, which has championed women's rights and it is uh, has a rich and complicated history around that issue. So when we're talking, uh, and we were talking earlier about the Constitution and uh, Nwako Ramaklodi's uh, comment about the Constitution being a compromise, I think that is a particular reading among a particular group within the ANC of what the history of the ANC is. Uh, it's certainly uh, not true that there are no longer any champions um, within the ANC for feminism. Having said that, I think then looking at this discussion document, I looked at two. I looked at the gender document and the social transformation discussion documents. Um, I think what we, we see is a legacy of Mbekiism in relation to gender in the document, um, in that we see a kind of hollowed out feminism uh, that is dealing with gender equality as uh, being about women uh, only, and uh, women, and then and then in parts of the document uh, dealing with women slides into dealing with children, and I'll I'll come back uh, to that or the needs of children as if these were coterminous. Um, so it's it's a kind of on the one hand it's a it's a very thin understanding of feminism. Uh, on the grounds that it, it deals only with women. Uh, on, the, uh, on the second ground, it's a thin understanding of feminism because it understands feminism as being about numerical increases in female personnel uh, and tends to uh, slide over, uh, mention but not deal with adequately the structural inequalities that underpin women's lack of power resources and voice. I also read the ANC Youth League's 2011 discussion document on gender. And I would advise the ANC uh, National Executive Committee to distribute that instead as the basis of discussion, because that is actually a much more interesting and radical document uh, in many respects, which uh, asks questions about the last 18 years, asks questions about why certain strategies have failed, puts, actually puts those on the table, such as gender mainstreaming, looks at the institutions that were created by the government and why they've been uh, changed or abandoned, uh, asks very pertinent questions about violence against women, um, asks about the ANC's own commitment inside the party to these issues, and in fact lists a whole range of areas in which the ANC has dropped the ball as a political party um, itself. <laughs> In this presentation, Graham Bloch, an expert in South African education and policy, opens up the ANC's education documents in relation to the goals and aspirations that the ANC sets itself for this, its 52nd policy conference. I just hope that I'll not be seen as an ANC hack. But I do want to say that merely bleating about capital, or somehow hating the black middle class more than the white middle class, that seems to be a continuous slippage in our analysis, let alone ignoring the real history of monopoly capital in South Africa. None of this makes us anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, or anti-globalist. So all I'm really calling for is for us to avoid arrogance as we do our analyses. If it was simply a matter of abstract analysis, why get specific and focus on the ANC documents at all? So I'm calling for a measure of humility, of putting aside arrogance and of acknowledging the places that we come from.
and the realities of the societies and the era in which we live. That said, let me explore the ANC proposals on basic education. I think they are seriously flawed, mainly because they are seriously limiting. But I have heard, learned, however, that no matter how sophisticated your words, people hear what they choose. And sadly, many of my own critiques of the appalling outcomes of our education system have become ammunition for the white right wing to seek to prove that blacks can't govern or that apartheid education was better, or have become ammunition for business. And business seeks to prove that they can't find skills because the education system is so bad, and therefore they have no need to take any responsibility for the lack of training or for the lack of jobs. Now, the ANC proposals in the first place do acknowledge the tremendous progress we have made. If you were a tin miner's son in Cornwall 30 or 40 years ago at the age of 13, you would have been taken out of school and sent down the mines. Today, the UK has universal and compulsory education. And you can pretty much get where you want to as long as you're not a poor person trying to get a scholarship to Oxford. So I'm saying that education will improve slowly. But slow progress is not good enough. In a rocky and globalized world, where India and China are not really waiting for us to play catch up, slow progress just doesn't ha uh, hack it. And more than lacking basic foundations in maths and science, as the recent Anna showed, more than the sad consequences of this lack of foundations in insufficient high level skills, let alone vocational skills, as I'm sure Pili will one will point out. What is appalling about our education is that these gaps take a racial dimension even today. White kids stand a 98% chance of getting through matric and a 60% chance of going to university. And it's not the University of Venda either. Black kids are lucky if 50% of them even get to matric. And of those who pass, maybe 12 to 15% will go on to tertiary as opposed to 60% of white kids. That's before we even talk about jobs and unemployment. How can we reproduce racial divisions in a new democracy? No wonder there is extensive, deep-seated racial anger and all sorts of morbid symptoms as we've recently seen. And I don't think it's helped by the constant call to move on or even to engage in rational debate instead of emotional outbursts. I think this only discredits the callers and contributes to the ongoing trashing of intellectuals and of debates. Let's get real. Now the ANC proposals, as Richard has said, say very little about this. In this presentation, Peliwe Lolwane, who is Professor of Education at Wits University School of Education, brings her vast experience to the field of tertiary education and higher secondary education, digging down into the ANC policy documents and comparing and contrasting them with other documents that are currently part of the ANC's education framework. What I had in mind when I agreed to Catherine to do this is that I'm going to be talking about the ANC government policies in education. I do not know honestly about what they are discussing on the internet or somewhere else. Because these are the policies that have left, that have shaped our education as it is. And we are stuck in a way that is so unworkable as people who work in education and work with these policies. And they are still going to constrain us going to the future. And what I had here was to just give you as an introduction a chronology of events of what we have had with an ANC government, not ANC poli political party. We, we have had a NEPI policy formulation in this country in education from 1991 to 1993. And the very first and important act that keeps on constraining us is the SAKWA, South African Qualifications Authority Act in 1995. 
and we had an outcomes-based education in 1997. We have a Skills Development Act by the Department of Labor, but it's part of the education training in 1998. We had a new higher education landscape in 2000, and now we have a green paper of post-school education. The overriding problem was that because of the nature of how disgusting apartheid was, we wanted to transform. Uh, 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 we wanted to transform uh, apartheid, but we didn't know whatever came in disguise in terms of these policies. We thought that that would be better than apartheid education. Now, if we can talk about quickly about the post-school landscaping, this is one major policy again that has shaped how higher education is functioning and also further education training colleges. Talks about institutional differentiation instead of programmatic differentiation. It talks about the reconfiguration of the system. But we had this kind of idea that if we are going to expand our system, we must reduce institutions. If we are going to have a differentiated system, we must have a centralized planning of program mix. I mean, there are just contradictions in how things turn out. And we have to be able to have a diversified system, but we must integrate all colleges. They must come together. So we have got policies, but the way we, we, we try to make them work, it's quite difficult. And the FET colleges did the same thing. Now we just had our green paper in, in post-school education, which focuses on colleges and it talks about so many other things. I want to say that our overwhelming desire to overturn the apartheid education and training system has led to all kinds of outcomes, and many of them are not workable. And I want to say that because, no matter what is in the discussion document, we have to know that we have a government that how, no matter how much they realize how untenable the policies that exist, there is nobody who's bold enough to abandon them. Instead, we build new policies, we build new institutions, and we kind of ignore the other ones. Whatever is being in the document, I know that it's not going to divert from what we already have. We have, I like this oxymoron, we have a clear blind spot in our policy making. <laughs> It's our inability to realize the importance of building strong institutional bases. That, that is how we're going to build our education system. Instead, we have all these external bodies that extend all the way, and a strange conception that if we want expansion, we must reduce things. But the most problematic part about our education system is that we have a consultancy-driven policy-making process. We don't have a government that owns these policies. I do not know what happens at Lutuli House about the discussion, but when it comes to government at 123 Skoman Street, Skoman Street, the department I work very closely with, you'd find that everything is outsourced. And if you want somebody to own these policies, you cannot find them. In this presentation, Richard Pithouse, who is from Rhodes University and works in the Department of International Relations and Politics, brings his strong philosophical background into analyzing poverty and its meaning for the citizens of South Africa to bear in the second transition policy documents of the ANC. If we look at these documents, there are some telling aspects to them. The first is that all of them begin by discussing the ANC in a way that essentially sacralizes the ANC, treats it as something, something some semi-divine, something with a unique historical role. I mean, it's, it's, it's most ludicrous in the one on education, which um, just becomes farcical, where it says, you know, the ANC carries the hopes of people in South Africa, Southern Africa, Africa and the world, which, you know, is taking it a little bit further than usual. But part of the problem with that is that there's a tendency throughout these documents not to confront the problems in the ANC. And if we take seriously what was said this morning, what actually happens with policy is going to be determined not just by the complicated um, social and economic and historical realities around us, but also by those battles in the ANC. 
Where there is acknowledgement that there are problems, like in the gender paper, it's simply reduced to the number of people who are women who have positions in the ANC. There's no, there's no acknowledgement in any of these documents that there may actually be um, strong currents in the ANC that are profoundly and seriously opposed to what the, ANC, the faction of the ANC that's written these documents is saying it's about. So, for example, in the gender paper, there's nothing at all about the really quite gross degeneration of the, of the public discourse from key figures in the ANC um, since really Jacob Zuma's rape trial, um, which, you know, is, is not getting any better. It's, it's actually getting worse. I mean, you, you look at the way debates are conducted. Um, you know, you get people in trade unions saying, Helen Zilla must be stripped. It's deeply sexist language. Um, there's, you know, the gestures are made that this is problematic, but in fact, it's been encouraged. And when I talk about policy, I can only do so on the basis of my own experience, which is really about housing and is really rooted in Durban. And I think there's some particularities to the Durban experience. But in housing, there's some very good policies. There's some very good laws. They've never been implemented. And the state habitually ignores both the laws and the policy. If you organize, and you approach the officials and you say, look, you've got these laws and policies, we want you to implement them. What happens then is you find that the officials do not have the capacity to do so. And they do not have the capacity to do so because the provision of housing from you know, elites at the top of the party structure right down to the ward committees has been turned into a vehicle for accessing political control and patronage. You can't go ahead with a housing development if the local councillor is not going to get his stake, not just of money, but also of political power through it. And that's the kind of rock on which everything falls apart. And I think the complete failure in all of these documents to acknowledge the degree to which the party and its structures have become a means for private accumulation of money and power um, means that, in a sense, they're all, to a degree, invalidated. In this final session on the state and on security in South Africa that emerges from the ANC policy documents for this its conference in its 100th year anniversary. David Moore, a professor at the University of Johannesburg who has published many books on security and peace in Southern Africa, opens up the policy documents for deep review. I think it's kind of interesting looking at this document on international relations is how it condenses a lot of these contradictions that we have been talking about. So maybe it's on this interface between the global and the local where all of these um, tensions within the ANC that we've been seeing, um, we've been talking about, the contradictions of the, I think Daryl said, the ineffable national democratic revolution. What does it mean in terms of international relations? I'm not sure if I would have passed this document uh, in first year politics. Um, it's very, very sloppily written, lots of grammatical mistakes, spelling mistakes, and I spent about half an hour reading the first paragraph where, because they took, they missed a comma, whoever it was, maybe Nick knows who wrote this, but it, the, without this comma, it makes it look as if Iraq invaded Africa and South Africa. <laughs> Something about September 2011 and so on, terror attacks including the unilateral invasion of Iraq on Africa and South Africa. After a while I figured out if you put a comma after Iraq it made sense. So there's a lot of real problems at that level and I don't, I don't know if that speaks to the level of inter intellectual discourse in the ANC now as compared to some golden past which may have been 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 5 years ago. Um, but I think as, as Ashil was saying, it, it indicates that South Africa is kind of becoming ordinary, or at least the ruling class in South Africa is becoming ordinary. But it's a specific kind of ordinariness, or it's an extraordinariness, because this is a semi-peripheral developing country. It's becoming part of the BRICS. That is in the document. There's, there's not much about what the BRICS the BRICS mean or about what, South, what it means for South Africa to have joined the BRICS, but it's an indication that South Africa is at that new level in the third world. 
Durko now has, well, international cooperation as part of the new name for what used to be the Department of Foreign Affairs. And that means South Africa, along with Brazil, India, China, start to give aid to other third world countries. And you know, 20, 30, whenever I was a student, the third world was all together. The rich West gave aid to the third world countries. Now we have a whole new layer of uh, international relations and cooperation and development going on there, which is quite new. It doesn't mention anything about that in, in, this, in this document. Um, but we have kind of an ordinary country, at least as an ordinary developing country, because we're seeing this ruling class trying to accumulate capital very quickly. And as Maletsi said last week, it's a consuming, not a producing ruling class that we're developing here. So it's accumulating through consumption instead of production. And it's also trying to gain and maintain hegemony, in other words, rule by consensus along that process. And that's a very difficult process at any time for any ruling class, as history shows. And again, all the contradictions manifest themselves at the international level, especially, I think, with, with uh, third world countries where sovereignty is actually not an empirical thing, but it's kind of donated, it's been donated by the international community during the Cold War, after colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much to all who participated in the actual live event on May the 30th and those of you who have watched this podcast. Please keep looking at the WISER website for further updates, both from the presenters themselves that day and members of the public who will continue to participate in this key watershed debate.